Okay, so January 1st, New Year's Day, 49 is a Saturday, and I understand in most places in Wyoming, it's not too bad of a day. Mm -hmm. Weather forecast for the next day is calling for partly cloudy skies, maybe highs in the 30s and some snow flurries. And then depending on where you were on that uh, Sunday, uh, January 2nd, all hell breaks loose starting any time from about noon onwards, depending on where you were. I think that was one of the more extraordinary things about the blizzard of 1949 was that it... Uh, started unexpectedly. It brought with it uh, high winds and deep snow, and it lasted much, much longer than most uh, winter storms. And so, so it goes down in Wyoming history as one of those once in a generation or once in a century events, because it uh, combined all of those qualities of surprise and uh, furiosity that come with uh, blizzards, uh, one that uh, sort of matches it in, in uh, more or less general style are some that, that hit the northern plains in 1886-87. Back in the heyday of the cattle industry, the open range cattle industry, and those storms started uh, in November, and then there were just a series of them that raked across Wyoming and Montana and, and, uh, and did uh, incredible destruction to the cattle industry. So, so that's one that's very memorable in uh, Wyoming history. And uh, the blizzard of 49 is the second that's the memorable one, uh, again, because it has those qualities of surprise and just the ferocious nature of the wind and the deep snow. Of course, by 49, the population of Wyoming had gone up quite considerably from 88, and so a lot more people were affected by the blizzard than in 88. Uh, that's right. The, the blizzard of 86, 87 affected livestock, but uh, there weren't a lot of people involved because there were very few people living on those in those open range areas. But uh, by 1949, the agricultural industry had changed. There were lots of people living on small ranches and 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 farms around eastern Wyoming and and uh, their neighborhood uh, communities had uh, a number of people in them and so you're looking at a population difference of say 50,000 in 1886-87 and most of those along the railroad in the southern part of Wyoming to uh, around 250,000, 220,000 in 1949. And so the storm blows in on uh, Saturday really doesn't let, that first blast doesn't let up until Wednesday. Um, and then it's kind of a whole series of storms after that until pretty much, well, I think the last one they say blew through was February 20th. That's right. The end of it. And all of these storms came in waves and you just think that, uh, that the, the storm was over and you could dig out and shovel out and uh, scoop out all the snow out from around your place and then here would come the next one and so so again it was it was the series of storms too that made the the blizzard of 49 such an extraordinary event in the state's history now it was important economically but also i would contend that it was uh, indeed uh, a huge factor in the folklore of eastern wyoming because uh, i was a tiny child at the time. I was about six months old at the time, but I've heard the stories of uh, what had happened on our ranch. We lived 13 miles north of Lusk in the Hat Creek country, and I was six months old at the time, but I vividly remember, or at least I think I remember, shoveling snow all through that blizzard of 1949. And of course, it's pretty impossible for a six-month-old to be shoveling snow, but, uh, but the 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 myths and the legend and the stories and the folklore have, were so uh, uh, significant to family and neighbors that, uh, that even I got the thinking that I must have been there. And if I was there, I must have been doing something constructive. So these blizzards come in and essentially <coughs> shut down the state. Transportation, trains are, trains are stopped. Of course, the roads are totally clogged up. Mm -hmm. 
no uh, uh, airplanes in or out, buses stalled, uh, people stalled on the sides of the roads after visiting relatives for the holidays. It was a, it was a, a, a just a, a huge shutdown of the entire state until things started to get shoveled out. That's right. And uh, one uh, significant thing about it is that it uh, hit right at the end of the holidays. There were a lot of people who were away visiting family or friends. The uh, University of Wyoming, of course, had taken the, the holiday season off. And so about the time of the second or third wave of these, of these blizzards, there were students uh, seeking to come back to Laramie and discovering that, uh, that it was pretty impossible to get back into town. And, uh, and just uh, leaving from where they may have gone home. Uh, uh, there are people from, from uh, Newcastle and, and Lusk and Wheatland and, and all kinds of places, even Rollins and, and, uh, and west of there that had real difficulties even getting out of their hometowns. And I talked to some folks that were going to the University of Wyoming at, to at the time and they said classes were canceled for, s for some time. Well, it was re during registration, I guess, registration. Mm -hmm didn't go well and some classes were canceled for a while in Laramie. What's extraordinary about it is that the University of Wyoming almost never closes down. There has to be really a pretty monumental event, uh, snow event for UW to cancel a class and, and yet uh, it did so frequently during uh, January and early February of 1949. The uh, stories I've heard are, are uh, uh, a number of students that came in from out of state and dodged the, the various storms and ended up being the only people staying in, in the dorms. And, uh, and of course, the university was good about making sure that the cafeteria stayed open for them, but, uh, but it was uh, pretty hard going because they were there, but nothing was happening on the campus. They were still trying to shovel out the roads from every direction uh, to get into Laramie. And I guess the state highway department at first tried to get their snow plows out on the roads, but during that first storm, but quickly discovered that it was a losing proposition, and they just had to had to wait until the weather cleared up a little bit before they could uh, before they could get their snow plows really rolling and uh, start to dig out uh, Wyoming. It was the combination of the heavy snow and the strong winds that uh, created such huge snow banks that uh, the roadways would just be almost impossible to, to work through because uh, the uh, snow would be three or four times the height of a, of a highway department vehicle. And uh, we can't very well tunnel through the snow. They're gonna have to remove it. And it made it very, very difficult on roads, particularly uh, Highway 85, uh, US 20, US 30, uh, many of the major roads that people counted on uh, to always be open were ones that were particularly difficult to uh, for the highway department to open up. Right. And so the, uh, I guess, after a time, Truman finally figures out that there's a real emergency in the West and calls on General Pitt to uh, marshal his forces and writes a blank check and tells him to uh, get to work uh, digging out the Intermountain West, mm -hmm. or the, basically the plains, uh, Nebraska and eastern Wyoming, northern Colorado, southern South Dakota. Mm -hmm. The blizzard of 49 was uh, uh, actually wasn't felt very much in the Bighorn Basin up in the northwest part of the state. So people heard about it and read about it, but uh, they didn't receive the same amount of snow or the, the wind and everything uh, with it like the, the rest of the state was experiencing. So it was pretty widespread throughout Wyoming, but there were pockets where the blizzard missed and the Bighorn Basin was one of those. And I guess a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the cities and towns, even though they were cut off, fared pretty well. I think a lot of them depended on a uh, railroad for getting in, you know, food supplies and such. So I guess some stores got pretty low, but people, I think people uh, made it through okay. It's the ranchers uh, in the outlying areas that uh, were really, really isolated for sometimes weeks at a time. But then of course, the, these ranch women always put up stores of food because they, you know, they knew what could happen in Wyoming. 
the serious thing about the ranchers was that uh, even though there were usually ample food, food supplies, the problem was with uh, a lot of the ranch animals because uh, a lot of them hadn't uh, counted on uh, such a long and prolonged uh, blizzard and, and cold spell too because of course they would have to make sure that the cattle were watered uh, because they'd have the stock tanks freeze up and you'd have to go out and make sure that the cattle could get to water because that was one of the big killers of livestock in the blizzard of 86, 87 was the fact that they hadn't, uh, the cattle hadn't been able to get to get to water. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, by 1949, many ranchers had uh, put up hay for winter emergencies. And so it wasn't quite uh, the level of the 86, 87 blizzard when they were relying entirely on the open range. The one aspect that's interesting about the small towns is that, uh, that uh, Wyoming in those days was very well served generally by railroad. And uh, not only for as uh, passenger trains, but uh, also most of the supplies that were brought into these uh, towns came by rail. So uh, the fact that trucks couldn't make it on the highway was uh, was not quite as uh, serious as one would have expected if, if we'd had a similar event, say now, because the railroads did haul uh, a large share of the goods into the various uh, cities and towns in Wyoming. And I guess, but there were a lot of trains though that were uh, frozen to the tracks and a lot of mm -hmm. stalled trains, both passenger and freight trains through the duration of that series of blizzards. That's right, the Union Pacific in particular had uh, a lot of these huge snow plows and normally they were able to cope with the uh, snow banks that they encountered between uh, Cheyenne and Evanston. But uh, during the blizzard of 49, uh, those things would get, uh, get stuck and, uh, and they would just simply sit there on the tracks until such time as they could, they could, uh, it could thaw out a little bit and they could drag it back and get it going again. And I guess it was the quality of the snow too. It was, I've heard reports that it was so, so incredibly dense, these snow drifts, that it, uh, it was like packed ice almost. Yes, it wasn't like uh, the kind of uh, winter snow that, uh, that comes down and drifts and uh, it's sort of like powder on a ski run. This was uh, snow that was pretty lo loaded with moisture. It was snow that was pretty loaded with moisture and therefore it was uh, far more difficult to move than uh, it would have been had it been lighter snow. And then the, uh, I've, I've heard reports of, um, you know, significant loss of cattle and significant loss of, uh, of sheep in the state. Like you said, I don't think it was nearly as bad as eight, uh, 88, was it, 78? Uh, it would be 86, 87. 86, 87, but mm -hmm. still, you know, nothing to uh, uh, sneeze at. I mean, I, I, I think some, some ranchers w fared better than others, but some really, you know, lost their shirts too. Mm -hmm. Well, it was certainly an economic blow because uh, when you can't uh, care for cattle over a roughly a six week period of just constant snow and, and wind and, uh, and uh, snow banks and, and uh, uh, freezing temperatures, you're gonna have some pretty major losses. And so, so there were places where, where uh, ranchers were lucky to have their families in isolated ranch houses without having to go out and check on the cattle. It would have been dangerous. And in fact, there are cases of the, I think there's some 19 people that all told that uh, perished in the blizzard of 49 in Wyoming. That's not counting other, other states around us, but of that number, several were, were individuals who had gone out to check on their stock and, and then got disoriented or lost in the, in the blizzard and didn't make it back to the house. Yeah. And some of these ranchers, I guess, were so desperate for getting uh, hay for their animals that um, the uh, Air Force stepped in with Operation Haylift and were actually mm -hmm. doing uh, drops of bales of hay to, um, to uh, certain ranches that they just couldn't get for their cattle. That's right, and the, and the, uh, the uh, planes would come in and uh, circle around and uh, the ranchers would sometimes be able to direct where those bales might land. 
and those were really significant and and life-saving for lots of livestock for ranchers particularly in eastern Wyoming yeah. Yeah. and um, I guess the uh, also the uh, there were some drops of supplies to ranch houses too where um, perhaps people needed medicine or some food stores or maybe some uh, packages of cigarette or, or whiskey some of that would be dropped from the air uh, back in the in the late 1950s, uh, my brother and I were exploring part of the ranch where, where we lived in, in Niagara County, and we came upon a, uh, what looked like an errant package that had been dropped and had landed in some, uh, some scrub pine up in the Hat Creek Breaks. And uh, I remember particularly about it, a red ribbon that was connected to the to the little small bundle because it was to indicate to the to the rancher that there was something there that they should be able to have seen that that red ribbon but I'm not sure exactly what happened to that package why it was dropped uh, rather far from uh, the closest uh, ranch house but uh, but there were the remains some 10 years later did, did you open it was there uh, well there, there wasn't all anything all left of the uh, contents sure. yeah. but uh, but the ribbon was there and then some netting oh and uh, and so it looked like it had been probably probably uh, attacked by coyotes or something, whatever was in there. Yeah. Well, speaking of um, wildlife, I just talk, got back from Game and Fish before we did this interview, and they were talking about the uh, loss of wildlife, especially the antelope around, um, around Red Desert area, took a big hit, mm -hmm. mostly from trains, because they the tracks were cleared off and Highway 30 was cleared off around there and they'd come down to the to the roads and really got wiped out. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, others were found, you know, like frozen statues. Mm -hmm. The cattle were found like frozen statues. It was... But there would be very, there'd be very few open cattle trails and so, yeah. so, uh, or wildlife uh, trails. So they would find one of those shoveled out areas and of course naturally follow that and Along comes a train, or along comes a car, and uh, pretty tragic for the for the livestock or for the wildlife. Yeah. Are you familiar at all with the story about uh, Rockport, where they were all uh, that little bar and uh, gas station, or like some three hundred people found refuge? I'm not that. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. Okay. I am. I am familiar with the story, uh, and this is probably where you'll cut. Yeah. But I am familiar with the story that uh, Tom Strook used to tell. About how he and uh, and John, uh, oh, what's the guy? Uh, what's the the teaching center at UW called? The uh, anyway, uh, they were young uh, landmen that had just come to Wyoming, and they were returning from doing some land work up in the, in the Bighorn Basin, and uh, they hit the blizzard along Highway 20, and uh, their car got stalled somewhere near Highland, I guess it was. And uh, the fellow that was with uh, Mr. Strook had his old Princeton raccoon coat with him. And so he put on this Princeton raccoon coat and he said, Tom, you stay with the car and I'll go see if I can find anybody to help. And just about then, an airplane circled overhead and it was one of those Air Force planes that was dropping bales of hay to cattle and all of a sudden they both looked up and they saw a bale of hay flying out of the out of the plane because apparently whoever was kicking hay out of the airplane thought that that guy in the raccoon coat was actually a distressed animal and uh, just darn near hit him with the bale of hay. Uh, Tom, Tom tells that a lot better by the way yeah, yeah. or told that a lot better right. than I just did. Right. Do you remember the friend? Elbogen. Elbogen. It was John Elbogen and Tom Strook that were coming back from doing some work in the Bighorn Basin when their car became stalled in the, in the, the, uh, along Highway 20 near Highland. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, those two guys that were looking for help. Were there stories in your family about um, um, attics filling up with snow and unbeknownst to them? And there were there were aspects like that, but what was particularly uh, memorable to me was our uh, ranch house was uh, 
essentially under an entire snow drift. And so uh, my dad had to shovel out these tunnels out of the front door. And, uh, and of course, you couldn't even, even see out of the windows because it was just dark inside. And of course, uh, in those days, we didn't have, we hadn't yet hooked up to REA, so we didn't have electricity except from a, from a wind machine outside. And so it was pretty dark inside because of course you couldn't turn that thing on in a in a raging uh, windstorm and so the batteries had pretty well gone and so we were sort of like moles down in that down in that hole of that house as uh, we waited for my dad to shovel out the front door and get get out to the front to the house did you use coal as heat uh well uh actually uh, uh, uh that the house was equipped with with propane stoves by then so uh, that was uh, pretty early yeah. for that uh, in that part of Wyoming. I guess uh, I guess a lot of ranch kids had a lot of chores to do, and but a lot of kids uh, were just being kids. And actually, you know, you were talking earlier about sliding down uh, snowdrifts and mm -hmm. just having a good time. Whereas I would suspect their parents were probably becoming concerned after the storm after storm after storm kept roaring in mm -hmm. and our neighbors I've heard uh, stories told by by a lot of our our neighbors from around the ranch up at Hat Creek uh, uh, kids that were seven eight nine ten years old that uh, just thought it was just the great greatest time they didn't have to go to school and they could they could run out there and sled down these hills and and throw snow around and never have to worry about going to school for six weeks so it was a highlight in their in their education career, you might say. Right. So these um, these storms, you know, blew through, and finally, towards the end of February, it starts. It stops, and basically, it starts warming up towards spring. I'm hearing various reports about people saying, "Yeah, it was this beautiful green spring because we had so much runoff," and other people will go. It was the muddiest damn mess you ever want to see. Mm -hmm. And I think the mud, it all depended on where you were living because uh, the mud would build up in some of those gumbo areas, uh, particularly out north of Lusk. And, uh, and it would be pretty miserable trying to get out from, from places like our ranch. Our ranch was kind of down in a bowl just to the, to the east of the Hat Creek Breaks. And uh, I remember hearing about my dad having to uh, take a, a tractor and uh, trying to make it through the mud all the way to the top of the hill to get to the uh, to the paved highway. It was a good four miles or so from our place, and so so uh, just working his way out of the mud made it almost as bad as working out of the snow. Yeah, yeah. And I guess a lot of fences were taken down by it, so there was a lot of fence mending to do in the spring too. Yeah, there was a lot of work. There was a there was a um, certainly a lot of uh, of uh, of buildings too that had had been damaged by the heavy weight of the of the snow or by the wind, so there were sheds and other other uh, outbuildings at ranches that had to be repaired. So it was a it was a costly cleanup over a, a rather lengthy period of time. And so when you towed up all the economic costs, you have to take that into account as well. It was not just all of the delays from uh, the blizzard stopping off traffic, but it was also the, the cost of repairing things after the blizzard was long gone. I came up with a, uh, there was a figure, of a final tallying of around nine million uh, for Wyoming, which would translate to roughly 10 times that amount today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that would be, that would be uh, making it, putting it in pretty historic, uh, um, disaster, a pretty historic disaster class for Wyoming because we don't have things like hurricanes and, and by and large very few floods and tornadoes, but, uh, but that was a, a pretty major natural disaster for our state. That's all I got. Do you have any other stories? Uh, well, I could probably think of some, but I think you got them all. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Good. because well, if you talk to my Aunt Ruth, she's the best. Yeah. Uh, so, uh -huh. so uh, the uh, the one uh, the one aspect that I think uh, 
uh, is very important about it is that folklore aspect where it has become, it became in the, by the 1970s, even by the 60s, it became uh, a, a point of, uh, of community attachment because people who were there would share stories and there was a certain amount of camaraderie that came out of surviving the blizzard of 49. And people were still talking about it into the 1970s. By now, most of the people who were adults at that time have long gone, but, uh, but for several decades, it was uh, the, uh, the point of uh, weather comparison for every other winter that came along. Well, what was it like? Well, it's nothing like the blizzard of 49. Might be close, but it's not anything like that blizzard of 49. Yeah, I've had people talking about um, just that very thing. There may have been some more uh, snow accumulation and some harsher storms, but not like the longevity of this thing or or the low temperatures or the just the crazy winds mm -hmm. for such a long period of time. That's right. And around Cheyenne, they often point at the winter of 1979 and 80 as particularly a particularly bad one with, I think, something like 100 and. 50 inches of snowfall, but uh, but that came in uh, in a totally different way. It didn't come come all at once in a series of storms, uh, nor was there a lot of wind behind it. But uh, but uh, again, there were some comparisons made even then. Well, this is nothing like the blizzard of '49. You should have been here when when that happened because that was really bad weather at that time. <laughs> 